Well, Robert Harris, thank you very much for joining me. A pleasure. Dictator is obviously the final instalment in your trilogy about Cicero. So I suppose the first obvious question must be, are you sad to have finished it? Because it's been nearly 10 years, hasn't it? It's been 12, in fact. I mean, I feel a combination of relief (laughs) and some sadness to be uh, bidding farewell to uh, this figure that, you know, has seen me through middle age, really. I mean, when I started the trilogy, I I was, to be honest, slightly ashamed about how little I knew about Cicero. When I started, I mean, other than the fact that he was a Roman politician and was famous for his oratory and sort of epigrammatic wit. But what was the chief appeal of him as a character for you? Well, I actually didn't know much more than that myself. His appeal as a character, well, two things, really. One is that he left behind an enormous amount of writing. I mean, Mm. the standard edition of his work runs to 20 nine volumes, including 850 letters, which are really riveting insights to his personality. So we knew a lot about him. And the personality that comes through is quite modern Mm. uh, in its sensibilities. He was a self-made man who rose by his ability as a speaker and a writer. Mm. And he he wasn't rich. He didn't have a huge army or Mm. family connections. He was a self-made man. And that is appealing, I think, to a modern audience. In many ways, he was the first professional politician in history. Yeah, well, actually, that was the next thing I was going to come on to say, because obviously you started as a political journalist, and it's easy to see the appeal of Cicero if you approach him from that angle, because he's often slippery, sometimes ruthless, but he always justifies his actions in terms of his overall loyalty to the Roman Republic. Yeah, I mean, he wrote a lot about the theory of politics, and he came to the view that a good politician was like a doctor with Mm. a patient or a pilot of a ship. And he saw politics as a profession. I mean, Mm. he thought that he acquired over the course of his life the ability to handle men, handle events, and to try and make things as good as possible for the republic. And I think that was genuine. He was certainly vain. uh, He had plenty of flaws. But on the whole, I think that that was his conception of power. Whereas the men he was up against, in particular Julius Caesar, never thought of power in those terms at all. They saw themselves entirely in terms of dictatorship or ruling and domination, personal power. They didn't consider a kind of wider good. You are writing from the point of view of Cicero, and I wonder how much you saw him as an anti-hero rather than a, a hero. I mean, are there things that, as you were researching it and writing it, that you just felt, well, I can't justify this or I just don't like this about this person? No, I think on the whole, he certainly made lots of mistakes. He he twisted and turned. He, you know, professional politics, one of the mm-hmm. themes of the novel, demands mm-hmm. a certain degree of hypocrisy. So, yeah. Principles um, versus pragmatism. Yeah, too. and so he's constantly tacking into the wind. But mm. on the whole, I, that I found admirable, much mm. more so than a sort of, you know, keen marine kind of unchanging, unflinching viewpoint. I liked his cleverness. And he really is a sort of cat tiptoeing through a jungle, really, with perils on all sides. And the miracle is that he managed it to pretty well remain the last man standing yes. after 25 years, because virtually every major player in the book dies violently. Yes, exactly. Uh, and he is the last to go. He is, in a sense, an anti-hero, but on the whole, I admire him greatly, and I believe that his philosophy is, of politics is the same as mine, in mm. fact. Well, because he is a man of many parts. I mean, you mentioned politician, but also a philosopher and a a lawyer. Uh, Reading through the whole trilogy, I found it's often difficult to know which part of his personality was the dominant one. The politician he reminds me most of is Winston Churchill, although he Uh, wasn't a warrior like Churchill. But he had Churchill's gargantuan appetite for life. And he had another thing that Churchill had, which was he was a journalist or a writer as well as a man of action, so that the one, the writer, was always observing the man of action and always thinking about his place in history and how this would play in the years to come. And it's clear to me that Churchill took much more from Cicero than is generally Mm. recognised. He must have read him as a young man. And certain patterns of freight speech and so on are the same. So if you're looking for someone who Cicero was like, I would say if you can imagine Churchill without the bellicosity, you'd come close to Cicero. We should say for anyone who hasn't read any of the books yet, the whole trilogy is told through the eyes of Tiro. Or yeah. Tiro? I'm not sure how you Nobody knows. So I, some, sure. and I, sometimes I call him Tiro, sometimes <laughs> I call him Tyro. <laughs> anyway, he's Cicero's devoted slave who also acts as his secretary. But he was a real person. And I suppose your approach in part was to recreate his lost biography of Cicero that is mentioned by other classical 
thinkers. Yes, I mean, I started off 12 years ago. I wanted to write a big grand novel about politics and decided to set it in Rome because that would universalize it. And then when I realized I was covering 25 years with this massive number <laughs> of characters and events that I would need to probably make it three books. And then the question arose, how would I tell it? I had all these characters and events. And, of course, I could have told it from multiple points of view, but then it would have been like a history book, and it would have been beyond my ability to control it. So then first person became the best way, the classic way, the Robert Graves, I Claudius mm. way of getting into the ancient world. Cicero is a genius, and a genius is best described from the outside. And so I hit upon this real-life figure, his secretary who was with him, for, for all his career and who long outlived him and did write a three-volume history of his dead master and also was himself a good writer and invented shorthand or a form of shorthand and things that we have today, various squiggles and riddles. The ampersand, and, I think. Yes, that, yeah. they, are, they are from his notation system. So it's plausible. He was writing down Cicero's speeches as they were delivered for the record mm -hmm. to publish them and also would be taken into confidential meetings to make a note of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so he became the perfect camera really, to drop into that world and humanize it. And, you know, when you say you're saying goodbye to Cicero, I am, but I'm also saying goodbye to Tiro, yes. who in many ways is my kind of alter ego throughout the books. It was very plain from reading through the trilogy the amount of research that must have got into all of this. But how long do you spend on research and how long do you spend on the writing? Because I always feel as a journalist that a well-researched article writes itself to an extent, but I can imagine it's a much more involved process with a full-length book. Yeah, well, the research for this trilogy, pure research was two years, mm. doing nothing, not actually writing anything, but just researching. And my research file has ended up at about three quarters of a million words, almost all of which I would have mm. typed in. So that was a mighty labor. But I needed to have my whole world before I could really start thinking about the third volume. You know, I had to know what was in the third volume before I could start on the first. So mm. that was a huge amount of research. And I reckon, because I've done other books, I've probably worked seven years full-time on this trilogy, two years of which was research, probably a little bit of research also for each of the volumes. So it roughly works out at about 50-50, I think. And, and other books that I've done, for instance, the last one about the Dreyfus Affair, yes. I'd say was about six months research and six months writing. This novel is obviously one of many you've written about real events and real people. What is the appeal of historical fiction uh, as a writer? And do you think it's somewhat sort of underrated or undervalued by the so-called literary establishment? You know, historical fiction is a slight misnomer in my view. I don't write this as escapism. If you latch on to something in the past, be it the rise of Cicero or the Dreyfus Affair, you do it because there's something in it that appeals to us now, that it has some echo, some relevance. And so I think one really is writing novels about the here and now. It's very treacherous to try and write a novel of the moment because it can be out of date by the time it hits the bookshelves. But a historical novel doesn't really date. For me, it's a way of universalizing a story. I mean, the Dreyfus novel was about whistleblowing, really, and power. And this is a novel about the universality of certain rules of politics, certain types that go into politics, certain situations that endlessly recur, and the fear that, in the end, these systems, democratic systems, which seem so solid to us, can very easily collapse unexpectedly. Mm. So for me, writing historical fiction is just a means of writing about the present day. And as for the literary establishment, <laughs> I take no notice of that. <laughs> I was thinking, obviously, as I finished Dictator, it would be an absolutely wonderful series to adapt for television. Could you ever see yourself doing that? I wouldn't do it, but there is interest in turning it into a TV mm. series or several TV series, and I hope, you know, the contracts are being drawn up. So, you know, I hope that that's going to happen. I'm long in the tooth in this business now. After It's nearly 25 years since I started writing Fatherland, my first novel. This is my 10th novel. Mm. Some have been made into films. Almost all of them had been optioned, but often things never happen. So until it actually yeah. is on the screen, take nothing for granted. Yes, is my I've, advice. I've spoken to many writers who talk in frustrating terms yes. about this world. And as we said earlier, the trilogy is now over and you've waved goodbye to Cicero and Tiro. What is next up for you as a writer? Well, I'm researching a novel at the moment that I'm really enjoying doing. It's not set in the past, actually. 
And I would very much like to try and write it in the first six months of next year, if I can, because I find that I am happiest professionally and personally, really, when I'm writing a novel. And I miss not writing a novel. And because most of my books have to come out in the autumn, if I don't get it out for next autumn, it's going to be another year. And I know I'll just waste a year. <laughs> so I'd quite like to get on with that the moment I've finished doing the publicity round for Dictator. And we shall... Wait and see if it works. Right, well, um, wait with a uh, bated breath in that case, Robert. Thank you very much for joining a us. pleasure, thank you. And Dictator is out now, and you can buy a copy in the Reader's Digest shop.